<laughs> oh no. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know that we still have a couple folks who are joining us um, in the room, but we're gonna go ahead and get started just to try to keep ourselves on schedule. I'd like to welcome you to our special series that we're running this week, Florida Talks at Home, Let's Talk About Water. My name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director at Florida Humanities. And tonight we have Dr. Jack Davis from the University of Florida who's gonna to talk to us about the Gulf as well as the Bald Eagle. Uh, but before we get into that, there's just a couple things that I wanted to mention um, at the beginning of tonight's program. Uh, Florida Humanities is hosting this week-long series of programs focusing on various aspects of water. Now we're doing this in the lead up to the launch of Waterways. It's a Smithsonian Museum on Main Street exhibition that is going to travel the state of Florida um, starting this month and going into September, 2022. Uh, with its impassioned focus on local history, education, and community redevelopment, the Smithsonian's Museum on Main Street program is one of the Smithsonian's most inspirational and enduring outreach programs. And again, this particular exhibition explores the endless motion of the water cycle, from water's effect on landscape, settlement, and migration, to its impact on culture and spirituality. And that tour is going to launch this Saturday at the Citrus County Historical Society in Inverness, and as I mentioned, it's going to tour from June of this year until September 2022. If you want to see the full schedule and for more information on waterways, you can visit floridahumanities.org slash moms. And by the way, we're grateful to Palette One and to the law firm of Han, Lozier and Parks for their generous support of the statewide exhibition. Don't forget that you can see more about any moms related programs that we have and other programs sponsored by Florida Humanities by visiting floridahumanities.org slash events. Now at the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey in your email. We would greatly appreciate if you took a few moments to fill it out for us. Let us know what you enjoyed about the program, things we can improve for next time, and any topics that you might be curious to hear about in the future. And by the way, your support is essential to helping sustain these programs and to make them possible. If you enjoy tonight's program, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org slash support to contribute to our organization and to make sure that we can keep these programs moving forward. And again, tonight we welcome Dr. Jack Davis. He's a professor of history and the Rothman Family Chair in the Humanities at the University of Florida. Dr. Davis specializes in environmental history and sustainability studies, and is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Davis. Thank you, Keith. Um, and thank you uh, for, and, and the Flor Florida Humanities Council for inviting me to be a part of the series. Um, I, um, gosh, I, I've been working with the uh, Florida Humanities Council now, I think for 20 years and just a fantastic organization and I think all the folks streaming in um, recognize that um, that's true. And, and please do fill out that survey, it's important to them. I know we have our email inboxes flooded with surveys. I generally forward mine to a friend of mine, um, but uh, this is an important survey. Uh, and um, so they would appreciate your feedback. Um, and you know, I'm particularly grateful that Keith, you've invited me to talk about uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the bald eagle, two of my favorite topics. I am just finished a book on the bald eagle that will be out in March 2022. Uh, and so to bring these two together in, in, in a talk is uh, particularly special for me. And, it, and although it might seem a little bit contrived to put the bald eagle and, and the Gulf together in the same talk, historically, um, it's uh, bald eagles have, have nested in Florida from Key West to Pensacola. In fact, researchers uh, once observed that uh, the middle coastal region of Florida, including Tampa Bay, uh, existed, quote, among the densest, within the, that region existed among the densest breeding concentrations of a large raptor known anywhere on earth, end quote. And raptor, of course, refers to, in this case, uh, the, the bald eagle. The bald eagle is a bird of prey, meaning a, a bird that hunts live animals for its food, uh, and a raptor is a bird of prey with a hooked beak uh, that it uses to rip its, uh, uh, its food apart, the, uh, the meat apart or the, the catch apart. Uh, sorry for that, that particular graphic illustration. 
Um, and it's only in words. I didn't, didn't show any pictures. But, um, and I, but I also should note that another reason why the two are a good fit is because the, the bald eagle is a member of the sea eagle genus. Uh, and um, it will, the bald eagle will uh, hunt in the air for birds. It will also hunt on the land for, for mammals, small land mammals. Uh, and, but it also fishes in salt water and fresh water. And it prefers by far fish to, um, uh, to those other two tables. And in fact, the majority, according to some studies, the majority of bald eagle nests are within a couple of hundred feet, located within a couple of hundred feet of water. And bald eagles have been around the Gulf for a long time. Uh, and fossil evidence of the existence of balds, who, which by the way are descendants of kites, dates to a million years. The Gulf of Mexico is 300 million years old. So uh, it's reasonable to assume that bald eagles have been uh, on, on the Gulf as long as they've been around. And uh, now humans have been on the Gulf uh, a, a relative, a comparatively short period of time, eight to 10,000 years. Uh, and Western culture has had a footprint on the Gulf of Mexico for uh, 500 years. And conservatively, when the Spanish arrived in the 16th century, when the Spanish arrived in North America in the Gulf of Mexico, um, there were probably 2,000 nesting pairs. In, and again, this is a very conservative number. Uh, nesting pairs of bald eagles in what is today Florida. There were, according to some estimates, there were over 500,000, around 500,000 in North America. And I think that's a, a, a quite low number because that's how many exist in North America today. Um, the bald eagle is, a, is a one of 68 eagle species that exist across the globe. Uh, and, but the bald eagle is, is um, is only a North American bird. It lives nowhere else. It's a North American homebody. The only other eagle that lives in North America with the bald eagle is the golden eagle, but the golden eagle uh, also lives in other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so the bald eagle is truly an, an American bird. In fact, that's uh, the subtitle of my, my book, The Bald Eagle, The Improbable Journey of America's Bird. And um, of those 500 years that Western culture has, had, has been in North America and also in Florida, 150 or so of those years were un quite unsettling for, for bald eagles, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the last 50 years has represented a major shift in that relationship for the better. Uh, and water has been at the center of that relationship. Um, clean water in particular. Um, a key person in the American relationship with the bald eagle in the 20th century and witness to those, those bad years, those worst years for the bald eagle uh, was a Floridian, or I should say a transplant um, to, to Florida. His name was Charles Broly. Um, Broly was a banker from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Uh, and in 1939, he retired to Tampa along with his, his wife and his, his daughter. And at the time, Tampa Bay, well, actually it still is today, is the second largest open water estuary on the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. It's a 2,200 square mile fishbowl for more than 200 species. When Broly was uh, moved to Tampa in, in 1939, the water was clean and clear. Seagrass and oyster beds uh, stretched for miles. Uh, the bay was this splendid pantry for nesting bald eagles, which lived all around the, the Tampa Bay area. And what this banker from Canada did, um, Charles Burley, when he moved to Tampa, was he began climbing trees, um, something he had never done before. Uh, he began climbing 80, 60, 70, 80 foot tall loblolly and uh, longleaf pine trees to band eaglets. Uh, pine trees are a, a favorite nesting tree of uh, bald eagles in um, the southern U.S. And um, when, when Broly started banding eagles in 1939, nobody else was doing it. Uh, there had never been any systematic banding of eagles. 
Um, birds were being banded, but mainly mainly songbirds at at, at the at the time, and um, and Brawley had his own technique of doing this. Uh, he uh, rigged up a rope ladder and uh, climbed uh, up into the tree, up into the upper branches, and then he would shimmy around those upper branches and get into the nest uh, and get to the uh, the eaglets when they were uh, approximately four to five weeks old. And they're at four to five weeks old, they're about the size of, of, of a rugby ball. And the parents aren't, aren't around the nest. Uh, the parents leave the nest, leave them alone in the nest. They just bring food to them. So he didn't have to fight off any parents. And he would ban these eagles. And he banded e or eaglets, and he banded eaglets from 1939 to 1959 until age 79. Uh, for 21 seasons, he did this, uh, and, and he ended up banding over 1,200 uh, eaglets, and he climbed, he estimated, some 1,100 trees. Never fell out of, of, of a tree, by the way. And, um, and what his banding uh, did for all those years um, was, or from his banding of these, these eagles, is we, as scientists learned about the migration patterns, and, and they're uh, they're very haphazard, uh, I, sh I should say, but they've learned, one thing they learned is that, that eagles migrate. Um, many scientists believe that eagles were not mig migrating birds. And, um, but, but Broly's efforts um, for those 21 seasons demonstrated that not only did they migrate, but they migrated long distances. Florida, some Florida eagles migrated as far as, as Canada, just a few weeks out of the nest, by the way. Uh, they would migrate all the way up to Canada. Uh, some of them stayed a little bit closer. Some of them went west, more westward. Some of them went more northward. Um, but they, but they went somewhere. His his um, his efforts also revealed something unexpected. In 1946, uh, Broly banded 150 eagles around the Tampa Bay area. 150. Three years later, in 1949, he banded only 60. The next year, 24. The next year, the same number. The next year, 1952, he banded 15 eagles. Uh, only 15 eagles. Something was clearly wrong. In 1946, 83% of the nesting pairs in the Tampa Bay area, eagle nesting pairs, hatched eggs. In 1950, 83%. In 1955, only 16%, one six, only 16% produced young. 1959, in 1959, the last year he banded eaglets, he uh, banded only two because that's all he could find. Not because it was 79 year old man and could no longer climb trees. Broly would go to the city park every morning in Tampa and do push ups and pull ups. Uh, this guy was in, in great shape. And, uh, but there were only two eaglets. He, he only found two eaglets that year, the band. Um, and he learned that something similar was happening elsewhere in the United States. In Florida, he guessed that there were a couple of reasons for the bald eagle's population decline. Um, there, in, in Audubon Magazine in 1959, in an article he wrote, there are, there are just too many people moving to Florida. The Gulf Coast is soon going to be one long village. Well, he got that right, as uh, th those of us who live in Florida, in particular in the Tampa Bay area, know, or you know, Southeast Florida. Um, but but, Bro but Broly also knew that eagles were willing to live near people if eagles in their nests were left undisturbed. There was no problem for the eagles. Um, he found nests. He found eagles nesting on a golf course, one behind uh, a, a nest behind a high school, uh, one in a quote unquote fashionable suburb, um, another on the, the, the campus of Bay Pines Veterans Hospital. And if any of you are familiar with Bay Pines, uh, you know, it's, there are lots of, of uh, Longleaf Pines on, on the Bay Pines campus. Um, so uh, it's, it, it, uh, it makes sense that there were bald eagles nesting there. Um, but the most astonishing attachment to place that he discovered, and I should, I should point out that bald eagles mate for life, uh, and they also maintain a lifelong fidelity to their nest. They'll return to the same nest every year, as long as it hasn't been blown down in a storm or the tree hasn't fallen or some 
idiot, if you will, hasn't come along and cut down the tree. And historically that has happened. Um, they'll come back to the same nest and they'll refurbish the nest it early in the nesting season and uh, they'll add on to it. And some of these nests get to be quite large. Um, and, um, but the most astonishing attachment to place that he discovered was a nest on the perimeter of MacDill Army Airfield's practice bombing range during World War II. Of course, that's MacDill, MacDill in Tampa. Uh, there was a practice bombing range and right on the edge of that bombing range lived a, a, a bald eagle couple. And as sand-filled sacks, the dummy bombs rained down from roaring airplanes overhead, the occupying couple continued with their domestic routine. Um, but then five or so years later, there was a massive fish kill in Tampa Bay. And research later showed that the dead fish contained high levels of DDT. In the 1950s, Americans had thrown this coverlet of DDT across the country to control gypsy moths, black flies, bark beetles, Dutch elm disease, which is caused by fungus, uh, fire ants, mosquitoes, biting midges, which we in Florida know as noceums or sons of bitches. Uh, I prefer the latter. Um, and it wasn't just local applications that affected water birds like the osprey and the pelican and, and the bald eagle. DDT ran off into waterways that travel to other parts of the country. For example, over 60% of the lower 48 US states drains to, the, including parts of Canada, drains to the Gulf of Mexico. So DDT was coming down rivers from far away places down to the Gulf, down to the near shore waters all around the US Gulf states, including Florida. Um, the osprey population around the Gulf took a major hit. Pelicans dip, disappeared altogether from parts of the Northern Gulf that received water from the Mississippi River. Uh, and the same happened to the bald eagles. There were no nesting eagles in Alabama, Mississippi in the 1960s. Only four pairs in Louisiana, a place that should have had hundreds of nesting bald eagles. Texas should have had hundreds of nesting bald eagles too. It had only four. In Florida, the number of nesting pairs dropped to 88 by the 1970s and none west of Apalachicola. Um, America's inland waters uh, running to the sea were fouled by, of course, much more than DDT, um, you know, in the 20th century, particularly in the second um, half of the 20th century. As, um, but this has been going on for a long time. As soon as Europeans settled North America, they began undoing the ecological health of its water bodies. Some of the early, early catastrophic uh, activities included uh, land clearing, which salted rivers and streams, um, leather tanneries, uh, livestock butchering. Streams ran red with blood um, from the livestock butchering. Uh, factories dumping their private waste into the public commons intensified, of course, during the 19th century and throughout the 20th century as, as uh, manufacturing, uh, as industrialization intensified. Uh, ever since Mavericks hit a gusher at Spindletop, Texas in 1901, oil has been spilling into the Gulf of Mexico since 1901. Um, and ever since chemists perfected the bleaching process, the, the bleaching process in, in pulp paper manufacturing, and the first plant employing the process opened in Panama City in 1931, Panama City, Florida. Uh, chlorinates, including the highly toxic dioxin, have been killing aquatic life in near shore waters and rivers relaying to those waters, you know, carrying the, the fact, uh, the manufacturing discharge downstream, uh, fouling the waters um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, extraordinary ways in places like Pensacola, uh, Perry, Tampa, Bradenton, Naples, the mill in Perry, better known as Buckeye has been polluting the Fen Holloway River, which runs to the Gulf of Mexico since 1947, when the state declared the Fen Holloway River an industrial river, meaning pollute as well. And it did that to 
uh, induce Procter & Gamble to open up a, a cellulose plant in, in Florida. And there, of course, was the phosphate industry, um, which launched in the late 19th century when Florida was discovered to be uh, rich in the mineral. Ironically, that, that discovery was made during a fossil exploration expedition sponsored by the Smithsonian. Um, and phosphate mining has historically impaired Tampa Bay, as those who live around Tampa Bay know quite well, um, but also the Florida aquifer. Um, marine life has also historically suffered the impact of coastal reconstruction uh, from private contractors engaged in fit dredge and fill projects, uh, which were common from the 1920s to the 1960s, and but also from the Army Corps of Engineers. No single entity, no single entity in the United States has done more to alter and destroy natural systems than the Army Corps of Engineers. And on the Gulf, that destruction has come by way of bridges, causeways, navigational channels, inlets, jetties, uh, concrete seawalls, and upriver projects, such as the Central and South Florida Comprehensive Flood Control and Water Management Project that was launched in 1948 around Lake Okeechobee uh, to rework the lake and rework the, the Everglades. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that um, in a minute, a little bit more about that in a minute. But no less guilty than the Army Corps of Engineers were municipalities. Into the 1970s, virtually every municipality around the Gulf of Mexico, the U.S. Gulf, was dumping raw or poorly treated sewage into the bays, the bayous, and sound. And not just those on the coast, um, upriver, up the Escambia River in Alabama, there were, I think it was eight wastewater treatment plants who were dumping their treated sewage, their the treated wastewater into the Scambia River running down to Scambia Bay in Pensacola. And then in my book on the Gulf of Mexico, I described, you know how Alabama is just above the, the western part of the Florida Panhandle. I described Alabama as the buttocks on the throne of West Florida. And you know, Alabama's little uh, coastline are the two legs uh, of Alabama hanging over the throne. Um, and the uh, a tremendous impact on Escambia Bay and Pensacola coming from these, um, uh, these places elsewhere. Uh, thermal pollution from power plants and stormwater systems were also major sources impairing water quality around the Gulf of Mexico and around the country for, for, for that matter. Escambia Bay ultimately lost 95, 95% of its seagrass beds and oyster bars. Uh, because of what was coming down the Scambia River, because of Pensacola's own wastewater treatment plant, um, which was hardly treating the wastewater, but also because of a number of industries uh, along the Scambia River discharging uh, their private waste into the public commons. Um, and of course, you know, when the seagrass disappears, the marine life disappears, and then the bird life disappears, and livelihood disappears. Like birds, commercial fishers had nothing to catch in Escambia Bay when all those seagrass beds and those oysters disappeared. Over in Panama City, the pulp mill that I mentioned earlier killed off the oysters in East Bay and put oyster fishers out of business. Before dredge and fill projects, there were some two dozen bait shops around Boca Ciega Bay and, and St. Petersburg. And Pinellas County for a period in the 20th century was the most productive commercial fishery on the Florida Gulf Coast. I can almost guarantee nobody streaming in knows that or could even imagine Pinellas County being the most productive commercial fishery on the Florida Gulf Coast, but it was. But those assets disappeared. Raw sewage and phosphate mining, along with private and our Army Corps of Engineer construction projects diminished the seagrass beds in this once bodega for bald eagles, Tampa Bay. Um, and not just bald eagles, but also ospreys. When I was a kid growing up in Tampa Bay, I didn't see any ospreys. I didn't see any bald eagles until the 1990s, maybe ospreys in the late 80s. Um, but those um, 
Um, but the seagrass beds in Tampa Bay were diminished by 65%. And this was the scenario across the Gulf of Mexico in every state, across Florida in every state. So Charles Broly, uh, the banker for Winnipeg, Manitoba, was right about DDT and other contaminant, contaminants. And he was right about the one long village at the Florida Gulf Coast, south of Tarpon Springs was becoming. More people, of course, meant more sewage and more damaging coastline restructuring to accommodate those more people. Um, and what we were doing, we weren't just simply killing off the grass, seagrass beds. What we were doing on the whole was we were destroying one of the largest and richest estuarine environments in the world. That's the Gulf of Mexico. One of the largest and richest estuarine environments in the world. The Gulf has more than 200 estuaries. They're densest among the five US states, representing more than one fourth of all North American estuaries. More than one fourth. The estuaries along the five US states represent more than one fourth of all North American estuaries. Eight million acres. What a gift. But we ripped open the box. We threw the contents of that, uh, of the box on the floor and we tromped all over them with our big dirty feet. Uh, we weren't necessarily destroying the estuaries intentionally, but we tended to remain indifferent. We often looked the other way uh, and we often ignored the science and the consequences. Uh, estuaries are historically cornucopia environments for people too, not just wildlife and had been for thousands of year, years. When the Spanish came to the Gulf of Mexico, right in the Gulf of Mexico in the early 16th century, they saw great shell mounds all around the Gulf. And they also saw tall, robust indigenous people. They were tall in stature because they were rich in food sources. Um, uh, they made good use of the estuarine wealth around, without destroying that wealth. Uh, the Clusa in Southwest Florida are a very good example. The Clusa were a sedentary people who did not engage in agriculture. And that was unusual. Non-agrarian people tended to be nomadic people. They would follow the food sources through the seasons. But the Clusa stayed put right there in Southwest Florida. They didn't plant crops. They rarely hunted land animals. They didn't have to because everything came to them in the estuarine, estuarine environment in Southwest Florida. Just steps away was a kitchen restocked by nature for them. And interestingly enough, the Spanish didn't fully understand the economic implications of this biological wealth. And so they never pursued commercial fishing on the Gulf of Mexico. Boy, did they lose out. Um, the, the, the Spanish failed in many ways in, in Florida. In one way we don't talk about uh, generally talk about is the fact that they, they really fail to recognize the, the potential of a commercial fishery in, in Florida waters, particularly on the Gulf side. He was left to enterprising Americans to make that discovery, who not long after acquiring their first Gulf front property, front, you know, the Gulf front real estate, if you will, with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, launched a commercial trade in fish, shrimp, mollusks, crabs, uh, and sea turtles on, on the Gulf of Mexico. And the, the Georgia poet, Sidney Lanier, visited the Gulf of Mexico and the, the Gulf Coast in the 19th century. And he said of the Gulf that, quote, here are the blackfish, whitefish, yellow brim, blue brim, silver brim, grouper, corgi, barracuda, trout, perch, red snapper, drum, whiting, sturgeon, whip jack, skate, and one knows not how many more, end quote. Wall Stevens, another poet of the 20th century in the 1930s described this, the Gulf of Mexico simply as a quote unquote fishy sea. Um, and the Gulf quickly turned into, in the 19th century, uh, quickly turned into one of the most important commercial and recreational fisheries in the country. But all of that was jeopardized by the 1950s when the estuarine environments around the Gulf of Mexico began sliding precipitously toward ecological death. And the same was happening around the US in estuaries 
uh, coastal estuaries all around the U.S. Wildlife, especially once profuse marine and bird life, was disappearing. The foulness was local, it was also everywhere. Uh, uh, one would have to embark on a long and hard search to find clean water as indigenous Native Americans had known it. Um, by the 1960s, Americans made it clear they had had enough of the pollution. They were no longer willing to live in a foul nest, if you will. And the bald eagle was this high, high profile indicator of what bad water had done to the environment. In 1963, the lower 48 states had only 487 nests across the entire 48 states. Many of those states, I think it was 30 something, had no nest whatsoever. The bald eagle in the lower 48 states was at the brink of extinction. Um, but ironically, it had had, the bald eagle had had federal protection since 1940 when Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act. It was the, when that act was passed, the bald eagle became the only species to have its own federal law protecting it. It also became um, the, the only bird of prey um, and um, the only predator animal that was protected by federal law. But in, 19, in 1940, it was on the verge of extinction, and the United States was on the verge, you know, at the dawn of, um, or just, you know, moments before entering World War II, the United States was on the verge of losing a living representative of an, of, of a, of an important national symbol. Throughout the 19th century, Americans slaughtered bald eagles left and right. Uh, Alaska, the territory of Alaska for 30 years had a bounty on bald eagles and ended up paying for the killing of over 200, well over 200,000 bald eagles, all in the name of predator control. The bald eagle was considered a nuisance bird. It was allegedly a threat to the agrarian economy and to the fishing economy. Um, Alaska was killing bald eagles because they, they believed that uh, bald eagles were unnecessary competition for salmon fishermen, um, which, which was completely false. Um, but then when the Bald Eagle Protection Act was passed and there was this adjustment in attitude among Americans from wanting to eliminate the bald eagle to preserving it, at that moment, or actually five years later, DDT was released to the consumer market. Um, and everything went south, but a bald eagle, uh, other bird life and, and animal life, but also humans. Um, and when the bald eagle was at its nadir in 1963 with only 487 nesting pairs around the US, lower US, um, the bald eagle had the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, protecting it, it had the Bald Eagle Protection Act protecting it, and also had the Environmental Species Act, which in its original form was adopted in 1966, and the bald eagle was, was the poster animal for it. Uh, it had these three major forms of pro federal protection um, behind it, but there was little of the population of bald eagles left to protect. We had exchanged clean water for dirty, a Faustian bargain of a highest order, environmentally, socially, and economically. If a cosmic villain were looking for a wicked strategy for reducing a viable civilization to a failing one, Wrecking clean water sources was as good as any strategy. And in this disquieting reality of post-war America, civilization itself was the villain. A species of nature, Homo sapiens, physically 70% water was sabotaging the very nature of its own self. But Americans, as I pointed out earlier, were disgusted with the pollution around the country. So was Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, uh, who painted this bleak picture when he stood up in Congress in 1972 and said, quote, today the rivers of this country serve as little more than sewers to the sea, end quote. And he pointed across the way, reminded his colleagues that pouring into the Potomac River, the nation's river, 
the river beside which George Washington's Mount Vernon rose, the river that supplied his colleagues drinking water, pouring into it were 15 million gallons of untreated human waste. 15 million gallons of untreated human waste every day. Bleakness dominated the media in the late 1960s and significant drama unfolded in, uh, in, in the media that horrified people. In 1969 alone, there was the Cuyahoga River that burst into flames in Cleveland. It was, a it was the 12th time that had happened since the 19th century because of chemicals discharged by factories floating on the water. And off the coast of Santa Barbara, California was the largest oil spill up to date in US history. And, and television viewers were treated uh, to images of oil soaked birds drowning uh, in, in that water. Um, but this low point was also a major turning point. In the 1970s, of course, in 1970, um, there was Earth Day, the first Earth Day. 20 million people around the country participated in Earth Day, Earth Day celebrations and demonstrations. Um, Congress also in 1970 passed the, Na uh, the National Environmental Protection Act, um, or it, it, it passed it in 1969, but it went into effect in January 1970, which included uh, goals for, for clean water, establishing clean water um, enforcement provisions, but also created the Council on Environmental uh, Equality uh, to survey the condition of the environment around the United States. 1970, uh, the, the National uh, Environmental Protection Act also led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. And its first administrator, which is, um, is the head of the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, William Ruckelshaus, banned the, the, the sale of DDT in 1972. It's a hugely controversial move. And it was one supported by President Richard Nixon. Um, Congress in the next year in 1973 upgraded the Environmental Spe uh, Species Act um, and, and um, the enforcement rules uh, ultimately provided a buffer zone of 330 feet for bald eagle nesting trees. No one could develop or uh, creating uh, create any sort of disturbance within 330 feet of, of nesting, uh, nesting trees. Um, the Clean Water Act of 1972 was arguably the most important environmental legislation of the 20th century. Uh, it upgraded the 1948 Federal Water Pollution Control Act, um, which is a title that's pretty much a, a mouthful, but it was a mouthful without teeth. That act had no enforcement power. Um, Nixon, President Nixon, uh, interestingly enough, because he generally supported uh, environmental initiatives, he vetoed the Clean Water Act, uh, maintaining that the, the country could not afford it. Uh, Congress believed it could not afford to live without the Clean Water Act. And within two hours of his veto, of Nixon's veto, the Senate overrode him with a firm bipartisan vote. The House followed with a 247 to 23 spread. Nearly 40% of the yes votes came from Nixon's own party. Barely one third of the nation's waters at the time were swimmable and fishable. Um, and the uh, Clean Water Act had three major goals, to eliminate toxic releases, to restore all US waters to be safe enough for drinking, swimming and fishing by 1983, pretty ambitious, and to end every form of polluted discharge by 1985, even more ambitious. Uh, it established point source standards regarding water quality that industries, agriculture, municipalities, and US government facilities had to, had to comply with. It was the impetus, uh, ex uh, exceptionally important for Florida, it was the impetus for $60 billion in grants to local and state governments during the 1970s and 80s to upgrade old and build new wastewater treatment systems. Uh, the, uh, the 1987 update of the Clean Water Act uh, is, uh, led to the establishment of the National Estuary Program, the National Estuary Program, 
uh, which provided or provides federal grants to restore and protect estuaries that governors have identified as being of national significance. And Florida has three national estuaries, the Indian River on the Southeast Coast, Sarasota Bay and Tampa Bay. Um, and initiatives at the federal level, I should point out, inspired action at the state level. In 1981, um, Governor Bob Graham introduced Florida's Save Our Rivers program, a $300, a $300 million initiative uh, to purchase vital watersheds. And then he followed that the next year with the Save Our Coast programs that provided $200 million to buy coastal land um, and uh, to, to make it state properties, uh, sandy beaches, beach access points and barrier islands. Now, sandy beaches and beach access points, um, uh, you know, seem to give priority to recreation rather than conservation. But, but we have to keep in mind what makes for a healthier human environment does the same for wildlife. And the reverse is true. What benefits wildlife benefits humans. We drink from the same water. Even the polluters uh, drink from the same water. Um, and preserving barrier islands, which was the third element in the Save Our Coast uh, initiative, um, is extremely important to the Gulf estuarine environment. If you look at, a, at the Gulf of Mexico and look at a map of the Gulf of Mexico, um, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Gulf Coast is virtually almost bumper to bumper um, barrier islands, and those barrier islands are uh, are buffers uh, for the estuarine environments that exist between the barrier islands and the the mainland. Uh, buffers against intense weather, um, but they are also cordon in. Um, the, 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 the delicate fresh and salt water mix that estuarine environments require, the fresh water, of course, coming from rivers and streams. The Clean Water Act was not, you know, has, has not, I should say, met its original goals. Quality impaired water continues to stream, unfortunately, across America. 78% of lakes, reservoirs, and ponds, 55% of rivers and streams, and, um, 78% of bays and estuaries do not today meet water quality standards. Um, and there are still, of course, hotspots around the Gulf of Mexico. Galveston Bay in Texas uh, experiences, suffers, endures some 300 toxic spills a year. We have the dead zone, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone at the bottom of the Mississippi River. Uh, thanks to what comes down the Mississippi River, from the breadbasket of America in uh, the Midwest. The Scambia Bay in Pensacola is fairly healthy today. They can't get seagrass to grow back like they used to, like it used to be uh, because of lingering PCBs from the Monsanto plant that was there on the, the Scambia River, but it's, it's, it's much better shape than it when it, when it was since the uh, wastewater treatment facility and Pensacola has been upgraded. Um, and, or I should say in Scambia Bay. Perdido, Perdido Bay next door to Scambia uh, suffers uh, mainly because of a, a paper mill. Uh, and uh, we're, the, we're, most of us are probably familiar with Apalachicola Bay and, and the, uh, the decline, the ecological decline of that, the bay, that bay because of what both the Army Corps of Engineers and Atlanta sends down the Chattahoochee River the Apalachicola Bay. The Fanta Holloway River still uh, takes um, Buckeye's private waste down to the Gulf of Mexico. That river is a virtually dead, hardly anything lives in that river. Um, and at the end of that river is Florida's own little um, dead zone. Uh, Lake Okeechobee, um, of course, which drains down the St. Lucie and the Clusatcher rivers into the estuaries at the end is its own syrupy mess that we're, um, many of us, I think, are quite familiar with. And as a result, those estuarine environments on the East Coast and the West Coast can't thrive like they should. Uh, Tampa Bay still has the foul state uh, industry. Gypsum stacks, arguably, uh, are one of the worst legacies Florida is leaving for future generations. They are these toxic, watery landfills. They will be around of the, of the phosphate industry. 
Um, they will be around for hundreds of years and they are huge. Britton Hill in Walton County at 345 feet is the highest natural point in Florida. Well, there are a number of gypsum stacks around Tampa Bay that are taller than Britton Point is high. And we're still, still developing the coast in the age of sea level rise, adding to that one long village that Broly, Charles Broly worried about in the 1950s. Sewage and stormwater discharges have returned because, um, because the systems can't handle the growth that continues and because of rising seas uh, and increasingly intense storms. Anybody who lives in St. Petersburg and Pinellas County is quite familiar with what's been happening in Boca Ciega Bay over the uh, last few years. Nevertheless, I should point out, uh, the Clean Water Act was one of the most important and life-changing measures of post-war America, in my opinion, and I've written about it in three books. Um, the Clean Water Act made a statement about where we Americans stood in our, our relationship with the earth, wildlife, and ourselves. Um, the Clean Water Act, despite the fact that we have a lot yet to accomplish, the Clean Water Act significantly decreased pollution discharges. And thanks to enforcement and assistance, thanks to the right widespread support um, of the Clean Water Act and volunteer organizations and, and uh, elected officials and local officials um, and even industries, dead or dying waterways and water bodies, once emptied, emptied of life, rebounded. Uh, Tampa Bay is one really great example. Uh, vegetation came back. Marine life, marine life came back. Commercial and recreational fishing came back. Today, the Gulf of Mexico as a commercial fishery outperforms the entire East Coast fishery from Maine down to Southern Southeast Florida. Uh, it is a $22 billion industry, the commercial fishing industry for the five US Gulf states. It is the most popular saltwater fishing hole in the United States, an $8 billion industry. Um, and along with fish who came back, birds came back, of course. One of the most popular birding places in North America is the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and, uh, and, and birding in the Gulf of Mexico represents the larger percentage of the six, $6 billion wildlife watching industry uh, in, in the region. And the revitalization of bird life would not have happened without Congress's foresight. Americans could ban DDT from the land. They could attach stern penalties to the Bald Eagle Protection Act. But if they didn't mop up the mess in the country's waters, the prospects for species continuation, as I write in, in, the, in the Bald Eagle book, were little better than those of a lone bird on a lonely island whistling for a mate that doesn't exist. The resurrection of the bald eagle exceeded every expert's expectations. In the last decade, the bald eagle population in North America has quadrupled. And Florida balds went from a low of 88 nesting pairs, as I said earlier in 1971, to more than 1,500 today, including across the panhandle. It's the second largest breeding population in the lower 48 states. Minnesota is the largest. Minnesota is completely out of the charts. Uh, some 9,000 um, nesting bald eagle couples in, in Minnesota. We have 1,500. Um, but the Rays beat the, the Minnesota Twins. That's what matters, really. Um, now, as with clean water, we've, we've, of course, welcomed the bald eagle's return. We're proud of it. Clean water in the presence of bald eagles is a pat on our backs that we are doing something right by the environment. For wildlife, and for human life. Thanks. I'll uh, take any questions you might have. And I, I, I think people will be um, uh, 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 handling the questions for us. Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you for that that um, that talk, uh, Dr. Davis. There's a lot that I'm definitely going to be um, digesting. I think over the next couple of days as as we're doing this series. And part of what I think makes this series really interesting is that yes, we do have the launch of our Smithsonian exhibition this Saturday, but it is also near the 50th anniversary of uh, the Clean Water Act. And so you'd mentioned in your talk exactly. that 
um, it isn't it hasn't really quite met its goals um, as right. as a piece of legislation that was created 50 years ago. And you might have touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if we could just circle back for a second. And if you could tell us, what do you see as uh, potentially being necessary to kind of help the Clean Water Act live up to uh, what it was originally intended uh, five decades ago? Yeah. Um, and enforcement. I mean, you know, you can have a law. A law is one thing. You can have a great law. Yeah, the best law in the world on the book. But if you don't have the enforcement, the, the law is worthless, right? Uh, enforcement. Uh, and that all comes from, you know, various federal agencies, um, in particular, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency. Uh, I think we, we are already seeing a change in Washington um, and to allow the Environmental uh, Protection Agency to be a truly independent agency that was that both uh, that a bipartisan Congress believed it should be, uh, and a Republican president uh, in his age believed it should be, and always honored that. Uh, and um, so I, I, I think enforcement is is uh, is what we really need. We have the science. We have the recognition, we have the awareness, we have um, the will of the, the American people. We just need the, the, the enforcement. And to recognize that environment, protecting the environment isn't just about doing it for birds and fish, it's about us too. And you talked about this a little bit when you talked about um, DDT and, and sort of the role that it had in terms of, of um, its impact on the environment. And so David Capel is asking about, um, you didn't explicitly mention Rachel Carson, but I'm sure you've probably worked with her quite a bit or, or the things that she's done in some of your research. And she was instrumental in, in the banning of DET. Is that right? Uh, she wasn't herself, but her, her book brought awareness to the impact of DDT, which wasn't there before. It brought a popular awareness. From the very beginning, uh, the military, which used DDT during World War II, warned against its casual application in the open market. There were numerous warnings about the dangers of DDT the moment it was released on the market. And those warnings were largely ignored because the chemical industry, the manufacturers, marched out their parade of lab-coated scientists wearing horn rim glasses, no offense to anybody wearing, who wears horn rim, rim glasses, but um, well, you know, with the PhD at the end of their name, and I have one of those too, who said there was no harmful effects. They completely ignored what DDT was doing. They controlled the narrative around the, the industry, as in lead and tobacco, controlled the narrative around DDT. What Mark, uh, what the, uh, Rachel Carson did was she she left us a book that was uh, uh, was accessible to a general audience, um, and uh, and and so got the got the truth out there. And uh, but there were many many others, uh, such as Charles Broly was uh, who, who she who she cites who she mentions in Silent Spring. Charles Broly was probably the first person who made a connection between the decline of bald eagles and DDT. And there are many people like that with regard to peregrine falcons and, um, uh, and, and other birds and other, uh, other wildlife as well. So, but I mean, you, Rachel Carson, what a, what a gift to, to Americans she was. Absolutely. And, and when you talk about individuals that sort of had an instrumental role in helping uh, to advance environmental legislation or awareness and, and things like that, uh, Gary and Lynn Mormino mentioned the name Nathaniel Reed, um, and I don't know if that's something that you sort of immediately comes to mind for you, but I think they might have had something to do with getting the Clean Water Act passed. Is there anything more that you could say about that? So Gary and Lynn are among my favorite people on earth. Hi, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Great supporters of the Florida Humanities Council, as you, as you, as you know. Um, I miss you guys. I hope to see you soon. Um, but in any case, yes, Nathaniel Reed was, um, was an secret, assistant secretary of the interior during the next, uh, Nixon years, which were important years uh, for a shift in um, environmental policy in this America. And Nathaniel Reed played uh, an important role on many levels with regard to clean water, also 
uh, Nathaniel Re uh, Reed was instrumental in, uh, in, in sparing us of the uh, of the uh, of, of the uh, Miami jet port, which would have destroyed the Everglades. Army Corps of Engineers did that anyway. Um, many, many great things for Florida, but elsewhere. He was also instrumental in what became the Bald Eagle Restoration Program called Hacking. Um, and uh, he was lobbied um, by some folks in New York to start a hacking restoration program uh, there. Um, and he went back to uh, Washington and made that happen. Uh, he's a real hero uh, for Americans and a Republican as well. I mean, Florida Republicans have been staunch as well as Democrats. It's not, the environment's not a democratic thing. Florida Republicans have been staunch supporters um, of, 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 of the environment, uh, of a clean environment, a clean and healthy environment. Um, and uh, Florida um, wouldn't be the vibrant place it is with, if not for a lot of far-sighted people uh, in, in both parties. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's absolutely true. You know, I think that um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that that uh, Steve Seibert, our former executive director, is on, uh, yeah, and you absolutely. know, he was instrumental in, in Tampa Bay Water. You know, as an example yeah, yeah. Of, of solving some of these thorny types of issues. Well, when he was director of uh, you know Florida Management Council, he was all about talking about water, about making water a part of Florida culture, and he was absolutely so was Janine Farber, his predecessor. And they were absolutely right. I mean, you know, think of American culture without water. It would be significantly different. Think of Florida without our coast, without our water, without our lakes or rivers, uh, without our Gulf of Mexico and our Atlantic Ocean. We would be a, a completely different place uh, culturally and historically. Well, and I think that gets to something really interesting that we talked about before we came on um, this evening, which is the fact that um, you're currently in New Hampshire. Um, I think that's sort of your regular um, escape. Yeah, uh, Keith, did I this... tell you it didn't get out of the 60s today? Yeah, which, you know, we're gonna have to talk about that later, because that's just that's just really <laughs> offensive to say that, you know, when we're at okay. a pretty solid 90 degrees, at least here in, in Tampa Bay. But I wonder if, if you could just talk for a little bit about what we were discussing earlier, which is sort of this environmental culture. You know, you said that it's it's bipartisan in Florida, you know, that there's sort of that that universal yeah. approach. Do you see any similarities or differences in a place like Florida compared to somewhere like New Hampshire, where you've sort of been um, consistently over the years and being able to kind of like take some yeah. of those things in? Like what how do those two sort of compare? I think on some levels, Florida is exceptional. In the early 1970s, I think in states across the country, obviously there were exceptions, that there was strong bipartisan support for cleaning up the environment because, you know, the voting constituency was demanding it. Uh, you know, in the first Earth Day, I mean, there has not been um, a celebration slash protest equal to it in, in, in America. And uh, the, you know, granted, Earth Day today is not celebrated like it once was, but, um, but Florida, through both Democratic and Republican gubernatorial administrations, uh, with maybe one exception, um, really supported a, a clean environment. I mean, you know, and maybe the motivations were different, uh, maybe the same, maybe they overlap. Um, whether it's economic motivations or you you just care about the the, the ecological health that we uh, of a place in which we live, um, you, you you know you clean up the environment for economic reasons. You, it you know spills over into the you know uh, the good health of of of, of human life, and um, you know. Florida has this legacy that I hope that it can continue uh, well, you know, well into the 21st century and beyond. I think the millennials and the Gen Zs will, will continue. And I see this, I see this uh, teaching the students at University of Florida who I've been teaching since 2003. And Gary, of course, has been teaching much longer than I have. And I, I think he's probably witnessed uh, the uh, changing sensibilities uh, um, among the uh, the generations. So I have hope for the future. 
And, you know, something else that you, you talked about before we came on, which I thought was really interesting, is the fact that uh, I think you were the first environmental historian that was hired at Ecker College. And then Ecker College, University of Alabama, at Birmingham and University of Florida. Yes. So, I mean, what, how would you say like the field has evolved, the, the field of environmental history? I mean, and, and particularly yeah. being sort of that lone individual in that in that way like has it changed a lot from from that time for you starting off and, and where you are now yeah I was at I was at the lone bird on a lonely island whistling for a mate that doesn't exist uh, as I said earlier um, uh, yes it's changed dramatically when I went on the job market in 1994 I didn't go on the job market as an environmental historian I went on the job market as a race relations historian because there were no jobs. In environmental history, but I advertised myself as somebody who could do you know, as a second field environmental history, and that made me attractive on the market. But since then, um, it's the field has really exploded. In environmental history, has really exploded, and um, you know, it, a department, a, a worthy history department at a university really sh needs to have an environmental historian, and I think that's. Uh, pretty much recognized uh, uh, across the country. But also, you know, and we were talking earlier, what I've seen change a lot is, you know, the expansion of environmental studies on campuses, including the University of Florida. Um, one of our um, younger, fairly recent majors is sustainability studies at the University of Florida. And it's only a few years old, old and uh, it's become a really popular major and a vibrant major that is growing leaps and bounds. And we have, and we can, we can, it's an interdisciplinary major and we can have that because there are, I have colleagues in all my, virtually all my departments across, across the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences who specialize in environmental studies. And uh, even in, in the Department of Religion as a uh, University of Florida is a vibrant nature in history program as three um, well, one, one recently retired, but, but three um, uh, professors who specialize in nature and the environment in the religion program, and they have a very vibrant program. And so you just mentioned something else that was, that was interesting in the way you started off. It was um, that you'd sort of focused on race, and then you shifted into environment after that, you know, those, those yeah. opportunities emerged. Have you done any sort of research or work at that intersection of race and the yeah. environment? I know that that's that that is sort of important, and there are certainly yeah. certain populations that have been impacted by uh, certain environmental policies. But I'm just wondering if you've done any any sort of work or research at that intersection. Yeah, it's been tangential to tangential to what I have been writing about, and uh, I have toyed with the idea of of writing on environmental racism. Uh, and I just haven't done it yet. Um, it's, it's an important field. And um, I mean, every community experience has experienced it. I mean, just look at the Tropicana uh, field in, in, in St. Petersburg. It, you know, it has an environmental racist history. A lot of people don't know about. And, uh, or at least that site, that piece of property. And, uh, but no, it's, it's a field that's uh, gaining more attention also. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the last questions I wanted to ask you to, to wrap up this evening is something else again that we talked about before we came on air, which is um, one of the classes that you're teaching this fall is on, is on rivers of America. So I wonder if you could just sort of tell us what you are, um, what, what that course is sort of about, like why did it come about or what, what makes you interested in, in teaching that? Well, um, I'm still developing the course, a brand new course, so I'm not sure what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have some idea and it, you know, I don't take shape over the summer, but, uh, but also throughout the decade, anybody teaches and understands how courses, you know, change shape uh, along the way or develop along the way. But um, I, it's just in this course is um, the human relationship in the United States uh, with, with rivers, not just simply how humans have had an impact on rivers or have used rivers, but also how rivers have shaped 
um, the course of American history and, 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 and culture. And so we'll look at rivers in, in, in a broader sense, in a broader geographic sense in America, but we'll also focus on a, a few local ones. Uh, one of the books I'm assigning is Bill Belleville. You're, you're of course familiar with Bill Belleville, who um, sadly died within the, within the past year and wrote this wonderful book, uh, Rivers and Lakes, about the St. John's River in Florida. It's a beautifully written book. Um, and that's both historical, personal, and contemporary. Um, and um, but as as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why I'm teaching this course, right? not the main reason, but one of the reasons is that I'm hoping that in teaching, of course, I might find my next book topic. And so I, I, I do need to just add one other question in there, and it's related to the project that you have on the Eagle. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are, who are anticipating that. Would you be able to give us a sense of, of when we could expect it to arrive? March 2022. On the 140th... Uh, the 240th anniversary of the um, the adoption of the Great Seal of the United States, which gave us the the bald eagle as a national symbol, not a national bird. Talk about that in the book, but a, but a national symbol. Uh, yeah, so March 2022. I already have the cover, um, and uh, very excited for that to come out. And I'll I will be in St. Pete and all across Florida and and really coast to coast. Uh, on, 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 a book, uh, on, on a book tour, so. I mean, we're absolutely gonna have to make sure that we, I know that it's probably gonna be a national conversation, but you know, we like to think of ourselves as being on that national map. So we're gonna have to definitely make sure we lock you down for a few opportunities to talk about that book. Well, let me tell you, Florida figures, you may have gotten some indication from this talk tonight, Florida fig figures prominently within this history. And it's a history, it's a cultural naturalist of the bald eagle. Uh, you know, the, the American relationship with the bald eagle, historical relationship with the bald eagle. Uh, so it's not focused on Florida uh, by any means, but Florida does figure prominently in this history because the bald eagles of Florida in the 1980s were heroes. And I'm going to say nothing more other than that. And you know, if you think Charles Burley is this interesting guy, and he, he really was, there are a few others from Florida, such as Doris Magger, who spent six days uh, living in an eagle's nest in North Central Florida in 1979. Uh, fantastic woman, 94 years, uh, 95, I guess by now, I interviewed her last summer and uh, just as sharp as can be. And I love to hear that Florida features prominently in that because that okay. gives us some justification to kind of elbow some of these other folks out of the way. So we're definitely gonna be doing that. As do the Baltimore Orioles in their spring training park in Sarasota, not in a flattering way. I'm really curious. So we're gonna to have to learn more <laughs> about that in the future. So uh, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to all of our um, guests and all of our visitors for joining us as well. Um, again, you're going to receive um, a evaluation survey. So we appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. And if you're curious about more on the Museum on Main Street program, you can go to floridahumanities.org slash moms to learn about that. Or you can go to floridamanies.org slash events to see the rest of the programs that are coming up in this series, as well as any other programs that we might have either remotely or that are going to be uh, somewhere happening near you. So again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Keith, thank you. Love you guys at the Florida Humanities Council. Thank you. All right. Take care. Keep doing what you're doing.